Good evening. For those expecting to see Mike Gregory this evening, um, you'll be disappointed. Um, I'm Richard Friend. I'm standing in um, uh, to chair this wonderful evening, which, as usual, um, comprises two talks, a short talk to one of our student uh, award winners, uh, and then we move on to the um, main event with uh, Bob Bates uh, of the Pi Foundation. Uh, but let me start by mentioning, as I'm sure most of you are aware, that we do give um, 10 awards um, uh, of money to PhD students at a time when I'm sure it's very useful to them. Uh, and um, uh, these are students whose research can have real application. Um, and then they come and give wonderful talks. Um, so this evening we have Michael Whitehead from the Department of Clinical Neurosciences uh, he'll be talking about the development of a novel gene therapy for diabetic macular edema. Uh, but um, Michael is not here in person, so this is going to be a Zoom presentation. Um, and over to Michael. Right. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, well, firstly, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you all um, this evening. Um, my presentation is on developing a novel gene therapy for diabetic uh, macular edema. Um, the one thing I do need to mention at this point is that there are um, aspects of this project that are still com confidential and covered um, by CDA, um, and as such, some of the specific details of the um, selected genes used in this project have been uh, anonymized, but I can certainly talk sort of conceptually about what this project um, entailed. Um, okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about the pathology of diabetic macular edema. So um, on the left hand side here, we can see a, a normal eye. Um, and at the back of that eye is a um, uh, is, is the retina, which is labeled in yellow uh, here. And then part of that part of the retina is, is, is called the macula. And it's really the macula that's responsible for um, that sort of high contrast um, you know, high um, visual acuity um, vision that, that we have in, 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 uh, uh, in human beings. And if we look at this um, diagram on the bottom left-hand side of the, um, of the screen here, this is what a normal um, retina looks like. So you can see it has a very, <clears throat> excuse me, it has a very sort of organized um, structure with lots of different layers um, performing very specific functions. And it's really this, this lamination and this sort of structure that, that maintains all normal vision and means that we can see. Um, see properly. Um, but the retina is affected by lots of different diseases. Uh, one of those diseases is called diabetic macular edema. And this obviously affects people who are um, affected by, uh, by diabetes. Um, so obviously in diabetes, um, people can become uh, hyperglycemic and this means they have very high levels um, of sugar in their blood. And what this causes in the retina is, is the blood vessels in the retina to become leaky. Um, and once those blood vessels become leaky, uh, we find that fluid leaks out of the blood vessels and actually into the retina. Um, and this is very, very damaging for the retina. And it, it very, very significantly um, affects people's vision and affects the way that, um, that they can see. So if we look at a patient that has um, diabetic macular edema or, or DMO, um, in the bottom right hand of the screen here, we can see um, a similar image of a patient's um, uh, retina. Um, but we can see that that normal structure and that sort of hierarchy and that lamination is, is really very, very, very badly um, affected. And we can see lots of gaps in the retina, we call these cysts. Um, so unsurprisingly, um, this particular patient, I'm afraid, would not be able to see um, uh, very well at all. So I always include this slide um, in this particular talk, really just to show how many different um, aspects there are, there are to, to, to DMO um, as a pathology. Now, you know, I'm aware I'm not talking to, um, you know, to an audience of, of biologists, so I'm not going to go through all of these um, in a lot of detail, but it's just to really give you an idea of how many different um, biological processes are um, affected in this particular disease. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but if there are two um, sort of really key takeaway aspects of the disease, um, I'd say it's probably the ones that are highlighted in yellow. So the first is degeneration of the capillaries, the blood vessels, that allows that fluid to leak out. And that's what causes the, causes the cysts of the sort of buildup of fluid um, within the retina, which you know, disrupts that structure uh, and ultimately affects um, the particular patient's um, vision. Um, the other thing that's become clear uh, more recently in DMO um, is that it's not just the blood vessels are affected. So if you look at the right-hand side of this, of this flowchart here, 
we can see how the hyperglycemia um, is causing that vascular hyperpermeability and that's leading to, to that loss of um, central vision. Um, but I'd say over the last 10 years or so, it's become clear that, 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 that there is also a very, um, you know, there is also a role for um, the degeneration of neuronal cells in the retina. Um, and in particular, um, a, a type of cell called a ganglion cell. Um, and these are cells that take, which take information from the retina and pass it into the brain. And it's really the brain that, that sort of, you know, takes that information and forms, forms an image in our mind. So clearly, if we see ganglion cell dysfunction, then that will further um, contribute to the pathology and contribute to that, to that loss of vision. Um, so on the right hand side here, what we see is, is someone who clearly has normal vision um, and then the patient affected with DMO, we can see these black spots where, you know, their retina, their macula isn't functioning properly. And that's quite, you know, quite clearly affecting their ability, um, you know, their ability to see properly. So there are some treatments that are available for, for DMO, um, but each of them you know, have, have their own sort of set of um, shortcomings. So I'm not going to go through these in, in, in a, you know, any um, great deal of detail. Um, but one technique is called laser photocoagulation, uh, where laser is used to, to sort of seal together those, those leaky blood vessels. Um, we can also give steroid injections. Um, the mechanism of this isn't completely understood, but these steroids have largely an anti-inflammatory mechanism of action by, dip, by bringing down the levels of um, inflammation that can also be used to control DMO as a pathology. And there are also some antibody-based treatments. So um, most commonly, patients receive um, an antibody that binds to a factor called VEGF uh, or vascular endothelial growth factor. And this is a, a protein that, that very clearly has a role in a lot of um, DMO patients. So if we use that antibody, we bring down the levels of protein. And um, in some patients, at least, this, this, this is therapeutic. Um, but what we see with all these treatments is that um, none of them can completely prevent or even reverse degeneration of the retina. And the other problem we have is that repeated injections of these um, all these different drugs and stuff is, is, is um, you know, necessary. So patients have an injection into their eye uh, roughly once a month, which is something they really don't enjoy doing. So um, any treatment that could be used, you know, as sort of like a one-off um, would really be a significant advantage versus what's, what's currently available. Okay, so I'm going to talk about now, um, now about the actual um, modality um, that we're using to treat DMO. And the modality we use is, is called gene therapy. Uh, most gene therapies are viral vector based. And what that means is we take a virus um, that normally has its own set of genes and we remove those genes and into that virus we ins insert therapeutic treats. So when the virus is delivered to the patients, um, it binds to the disease cell, um, it then enters that cell and it places its DNA into the nucleus. And that DNA can then be made into um, what we call an RNA transcript. That RNA transcript is then made into um, a therapeutic protein. It's really that therapeutic protein um, which has the, the, the intended, uh, the intended um, therapeutic effect, um, effect in that cell um, and therefore in that patient. And one of the advantages of using gene therapy is that you get a long lasting um, therapeutic effect because once the DNA is inside the cell, uh, it stays there for a very long time. There's evidence that these gene therapies can work for up to about 10 years um, in, in certain patient populations. And the other thing you can do is you can actually target the delivery of the gene based on what we call the tropism of the vector. Um, all that really means is the particular cell or tissue that that virus is able to infect. It will only infect that cell. You know, it won't sort of you know spread out around the body and start um, you know delivering its DNA to places that we don't um, necessarily want it to go. And so this slide talks through the um, the design of our particular gene therapy um, vector. So this is effectively just um, a strand of DNA that contains therapeutic genes. Um, on the left-hand side is a promoter, and that really drives um, what we call expression or sort of synthesis of these genes. Um, the left two genes, um, gene one and gene two, um, one of them is, is, is an antibody that binds to a particular factor involved in DMO pathology. Um, gene two is a, is a fusion protein, so that's a protein that we, that we engineered in the lab to, to improve its function. And the purpose of gene one and gene two was to reduce that blood vessel permeability um, and, and prevent that, that, that development of the, of the cyst and the retina that, that's obviously such a key part of the, um, key part of the pathology. Um, gene three is, is what we call a neuroprotective um, peptide. And the, the function of this gene is to prevent the degeneration of the retinal ganglion cells um, in the retina, which I think you know, is, is pretty clear now is, is a really important part of, of DMO pathology and therefore is something that needs to be um, you know, combined with the sort of uh, vascular side of the pathology in order to uh, maximize the therapeutic effect.
So to summarize, I'd say the objective was to develop um, a treatment to, to, to target multiple arms um, of the DMO pathology. And by, by using gene therapy, by using viral vectors, um, the intention was that only a single injection of this drug would be required um, in order to have a, a sustained and long lasting um, therapeutic effect in patients. Okay, so this slide talks through the in vitro um, validation and that sort of early um, proof of concept that we got for this particular therapeutic program. Um, so at the top here, we're looking at gene one, and we can see that gene one is, is bringing down the levels of this, of, of, of its um, you know, particular target um, protein very significantly, really down to, down to very, very low levels. Um, and we also found that gene one was effective in what's called an endothelial cell migration assay, um, where lower levels of endothelial cell migration are indicative of, of you know, um, a potential therapeutic um, effect in patients. So this showed that gene one um, was working pretty well as, as we hoped it would. Um, if we go down to the bottom left, we can see some of the work we did with gene two. So um, gene two targets a, um, uh, a cell surface receptor. And when that receptor is activated, it undergoes a process called phosphorylation. Um, and what we can see is that uh, the native form of gene two or sort of the normal form of gene two we all have um, in, our, in our bodies um, was able to activate a little bit of phosphorylation of this receptor. Um, but because we created a fusion protein of, of, um, of gene two, we were actually able to significantly um, increase um, that ph phosphorylation of, of the target receptor. So, you know, by engineering that protein in, in, in you know, a pretty clever way, we're able to significantly improve the way that particular, um, that particular protein was, um, was working. Um, and, and lastly, um, we tested gene three, and for this, we were using a cellular um, viability assay. Um, so in this assay, um, if you have less luminescence, um, that's indicative of cellular death. Um, but if you introduce your, your particular drug or compound, if that luminescence increases, then that's indicative of, of fewer cells dying. And this is what we found with Gene 3. Gene 3 was able to, again, significantly increase the luminescence, um, indicating that it was protecting these retinal cells um, from dying. And so this slide summarizes an um, in vivo study that we did looking at the um, therapeutic potential of gene three. So for this in vivo study, we were using a, a mouse model, um, and this is what we call an injury model. So we introduce um, a neurotoxic compound into the, the mouse retina, and that will that will kill the neuronal cells in that retina. Um, and that's something that we are able to show that we could we could rescue of gene three, so we could demonstrate the therapeutic effect um, of, of this particular drug in this model. Um, the top sort of panel here is what we call electrophysiological function. Um, so this is looking at how well the, these neurons are undergoing an action potential. In other words, it's, it's a really functional um, uh, test, which is really you know, kind of what you want if you're doing um, you know, drug development. And we can see that, that um, you know, the, the electrophysiology is, is significantly reduced in the injury model, um, but it's also uh, increased when we added um, gene three into, in, into these mouse um, retinas. Um, and we also took the tissue from this particular study and we performed a technique called immunohistochemistry, which allows us to highlight certain proteins in the retina um, with, with a fluorescent um, probe, and that allows us to, to detect the levels of these proteins um, in the retina. And what we saw in the injury model is that um, we saw decreases in um, a, a synaptic protein called VLUT2, which is a presynapse marker for, for retinal ganglion cells. Um, we also saw decreases in a protein called calretinin, uh, which stains for a few different neuronal populations um, in the retina. And lastly, we saw decreases in um, RBPMS, which is a, a marker for retinal ganglion cells. So this tells us how many of those ganglion cells there are uh, in the retina. So in the injury model, the levels of all these proteins were, were reduced. But when we introduced gene three, uh, we saw rescue. And we saw the levels of the, uh, excuse me, we saw the levels of those proteins um, uh, increasing again. And, and this was again indicative of the the therapeutic potential of, of, of this particular gene in this um, in vivo model. Okay, and then lastly, I'm just going to talk through the work that's been done um, regarding the, the actual application of this work. Um, so this, this project, this gene therapy project for DMO, um, was effectively the basis really for a number of patent filings. Um, you can see I lasted this presentation in April, so um, I can now say that the, these patents have been, um, have been filed. Um, with those patent filed, patents, excuse me, filed, um, a company called Caravec um, uh, was incorporated in January of, 
last year and then Caravic now has around six employees and, uh, and growing. Um, the company's attracted around 2.5 million pounds in uh, seed funding from a number of different um, venture capital investors and they also were successful in a, um, an application for a £500,000 um, Innovate UK um, funding grant to, to, to continue their work. Um, so the company has IND enabling studies planned for 2021. This is just a study that allows you to conduct a clinical trial and get your drug working in human beings. And the clinical studies, um, so that's when the patients will be dosed with this particular therapeutic, are planned for around um, 2023. So fingers crossed this goes very well and patients with, uh, with DMO will um, you know, be, uh, be treated successfully. And that concludes my talk, so I'd be happy to take any questions. Michael, thank you very much. We can take questions uh, from the live audience um, uh, or from the virtual audience uh, to whom can I uh, make the remark, it's much better to put your question in the Q&A link on the screen rather than the chat, because the Q&A we get to see. So are there any first questions? I have a question. John. Because this was fascinating. Thank you very much, Michael. This is John Cook. Um, I'm so pleased to see the, um, uh, the spin-out is, is uh, successful as well. But I have a technical question. I can understand roughly how the protein is made in the nucleus, but how, do you, how did you choose the protein to make uh, the fusion protein? Was it through clinical experience of, of some protein deficiency disease? Or um, how, in general with gene therapies, how do you choose the protein? Because they're jolly complicated things. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I guess there's a few different answers you could give there because obviously we, we, were, we were using three different genes. Um, with, with gene one, that was, um, yeah, it was an antibody-based um, recombinant protein. So, yeah, the objective there was to bring down the levels of a particular factor that's implicated um, in, uh, in DMO. Um, and, you know, there's numerous studies showing that that particular protein um, and reduct, reducing the levels of that particular protein is, is therapeutic in these patients. So, so, so that was sort of gene one. Um, gene two is a, um, more of an interesting one. So with, with native gene two, it, it aggregates very, very easily um, when it's, um, you know, it, it just aggregates very, very easily. So um, obviously when it's aggregated, it can't perform its function properly. So we, we basically introduced a particular domain on that protein to, in, to, to improve its solubility. Um, and by reducing that, that sort of aggregation, the protein that appeared to to, to sort, of in, sort of enhance the way it worked um, um, fairly well. So, so that was a choice behind um, gene two. And then, yeah, with, with, with gene three, the idea, I mean, that's, that's just a very, very short um, peptide. It's actually part of, of a much larger protein. And that much larger protein has been shown to be effective at protecting different kind of, kinds of neurons. Um, the reason we chose a short peptide was because there's only so much DNA you can fit into an AV. So if we had the whole protein, it simply wouldn't fit into, into the protein shell of the vector. So we had to use this, this particular very, very, uh, very, very short peptide, literally just to squeeze the whole thing um, into, the, uh, into the vector. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Brilliant. We have another yes. question. From the um, <clears throat> hello. Um, I'm not a specialist in this area, although I think my son was actually. Uh, unfortunately, he's now dead. But um, I have, so I have a rather general question, which is really how extensive is this phenomena that you're uh, attempting to treat here? Oh, do you mean what's, what's the pre prevalence of, of DMO? Yes. Yeah, as in how many people are affected? Yes. Um, that is a good question. Um, it's been a while since I worked on this project, so I can't remember exactly how many people are affected with diabetes, but around a third of people with diabetes will develop um eye disease of some kind um and then i think it was around a third of those people will eventually develop diabetic macroedema which is um really one of the sort of later stages of of what more broadly we call diabetic eye disease so i can't remember the, the precise figures but globally it's it's in the tens of millions so it's 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 a real um you know sort of yeah i think a very pressing um you know issue from from a, from a public health um, perspective 
Brilliant. I, wait, one further question. Yes. Thanks very much for your talk. Very interesting. Uh, this is slightly a bit different from the actual thing you've talked about there, but these therapies are these being tried now on other eye conditions, like, for example, glaucoma, where there's a damage to the retina? And, and if so, how far are people progressing with that sort of work, can you say? So that's an absolutely fantastic question. So I'm now working in a lab which looks at different inherited binding disorders and therapeutically the, the, the sort of main, um, you know, area of interest is, is using gene therapy to, to treat those diseases. So. Um, my, my one of my supervisors, um, he has been working to develop um, one of these gene therapies for, for an inherited blind disorder, and that's now um, being reviewed by the FDA for approval. Um, so that's really very, very far along in that in that therapeutic um, pipeline, which I think is you know, very, very exciting, certainly for him and for the field and, and absolutely for patients. Um, regarding glaucoma, that's a very interesting question because the lab I used to work in, they developed a gene therapy for glaucoma and then the, the second project they did was for, for, for sort of DMO. So, so I actually knew people who developed a gene therapy for, for glaucoma. Um, and that, and that, that was something that, that was successful in their in vivo tests. Um, that was licensed to a pharmaceutical company called Astellas Pharma, who's um, a very, very large pharma company over in Japan. Um, and yeah, the, the intention from, from Astellas is to, is to get that into the clinic, hopefully within, within a few years. So um, and that, that'll be a first-in-class drug for, for that particular application. So, so for people with glaucoma, um, yeah, hopefully, you know, within a couple of years, there'll be clinical trials that, that will start enrolling patients to, you know, to see if that drug works, works well in humans as well. So, so yeah. So, therapy to actually reverse any of the effects of glaucoma, or is it just to stabilise it and stop it developing even more sort of thing? That, that's a very interesting um, question. Yeah, the, the objective is, is to prevent degeneration. Um, so, that, and that's to, so that's by delivering factors that prevent the death of neurons in, in, in the eye. The, the issue you have with, with the retina is that, that the retina is also non-dividing. Well, so, so the, the neurons in the eye are non-dividing. So once those neurons have died, um, it, is, it is very, very challenging to, to regenerate the, the, the retina. So I think what Part of what you're referring to is, is it possible to, to restore vision? Um, that's more, that would be more the stem cell field. Um, that's, I, I think there's some exciting work going on in that field, um, principally by injecting different stem cells in the retina and, and trying to regrow that optic nerve. Um, in terms of clinical application, I say there are a few years behind the gene therapy um, field, um, but you know, certainly in the future, I can see some exciting um, stem cell therapies being able to, um, you know, not just prevent somebody from going blind, but be able to take somebody who is blind and hopefully restore some of their, uh, restore some of their vision, which I, I think is a very, potentially a very exciting future. Well, Michael, th thank you. It was a wonderful presentation and uh, you've drawn out some great questions and it, it's a really uplifting story. Um, it, it does seem to be, very well, clearly is an area where this, uh, the, the benefit to, uh, quality of living is such an, an obvious win. Um, and, and it's fascinating to, to, want to get to know that, that's, that there are targets within reach. I, I wish, wish your company every success, we all do. I, I hope you get there quickly. Uh, so thank you again very much. It was a fantastic start to the evening.